So it's two minutes past the hour and we've got 24 attendees at the moment. We'll just give everyone a minute more before we get started. Um, everybody's welcome to have a look in the chat where you can view things. Panelists and attendees can see that we've got the program for this evening. And I can see our first presenter has been allowed into the room, ready to present, which is terrific. So we'll give one more minute and then we'll get started because I'll tell, I'll tell everybody why. This evening, we have a lot of people who've registered who are going to be dialing in for the presentation of somebody they know or love who they has been specifically invited because they're a family or friend and that's what this evening's all about. So we will start. We'll start now. Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Pip Ryan. I am a senior lecturer and a barrister at the ANU College of Law and I'm also um, the LLM director. So I am the shameless Bruker of the Master of Laws in the ANU College of Law. I think it is the best master's program you can possibly do. And um, so that's why I'm its director. And it is my great pleasure, along with Dr. Will Bateman, to present this evening's showcase. I'm going to start with an acknowledgement of country and then I'll allow Dr. Bateman to introduce himself and he can kick off proceedings. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we are all meeting on together. We all meet virtually and we're in a number of places, not just in Australia, but all over the world. And as someone who was born very close to the Orinoco, I would just like to say that there may be people here who are from Venezuela and traditional people of those lands, or maybe your First Nations peoples from Canada. You're all very welcome to join this webinar today. We respect all of the elders past and present of these lands from which we all come and we thank them for sharing their space of learning with us and also I want to extend that respect specifically to the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. With that I hand over to Dr William Bateman. Thank you so much, Pip. Uh, I am Dr. Will Bateman. I am a senior lecturer at the uh, ANU Law School. I'm also the chief investigator of the uh, chief investigator for law of the Humanising Machine Intelligence Program, uh, which is an inter interdisciplinary research um, project which is run throughout the ANU, investigating ways that we can democratise and humanise machine intelligence (AI). Uh, and I'm also a fellow of the Gradient Institute, which is Australia's peak uh, non-profit non-profit ethical AI research organisation. Uh, now, this is a tremendously exciting event and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, hopefully you can see the program and so you can see how exciting it is. Uh, if you can see that program, you'll also know that it's rapid fire. So I'll be very quick and I won't take up any more time than is allotted to our amazing presenters tonight. But I wanted very quickly to open by talking about the history of law tech at ANU. That history starts basically today. There is a prehistory of law tech at ANU. Uh, uh, in 1993, James, Pop James Popple, who has then gone on to very high office in the Commonwealth Public Service, published a uh, doctoral thesis with, as part of the computer science faculty and the law faculty called Shyster, a case-based legal expert decision system. It's on SSRN. I commend you. Go and read it. It's a very impressive piece of scholarship. Professors Robin Craig and John McMillan in 2004 were lead authors on an, on an Administrative Research Council report into automated decision making and administrative law, which has proved prescient in the way that it understood the promise and the potential challenges of AI in the public sector. But those two parts of the history of law tech at ANU were really prehistory because they didn't involve students to a very great degree. There's always been people on faculty who've had interesting research attitudes and research projects which have had a technical dimension. But when I was a student at the ANU in 2008, law tech really wasn't the faculty-wide zeitgeist. It wasn't the most exciting thing and it wasn't a thing on everybody's minds. By the time I came back in 2018, there'd been big changes. The campus had changed, 3AI Institute had joined the ANU, the HMI Grand Challenge, uh, had, had commenced at the ANU, and there was, of course, a much greater public awareness around uh, the promise and, as I said, the challenges of 
administ of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, of course, another significant part of the zeitgeist changing at the ANU Law School was that Pip arrived, who really helped to breathe uh, life into um, this topic, into the ways that law and tech merge, conflict, and create interesting pathways for both staff members and students. So over the last two years, there have been enormous strides in this, in this area, and we're gonna hear about a number of those strides on the law tech front, particularly from our amazing student body. And before I hand over, I wanna emphasize two things about the uh, presentations that you'll hear today. Uh, the first is to acknowledge the extraordinary effort of Dr. Pip Ryan and a marvelous member of staff, um, JN Teo, who have put enormous amounts of effort into this event, making sure that it's a success and making sure that it's exciting and energetic. And I also want to emphasize what a privilege it is for us as academics to be able to observe the next generation of lawyers grapple with a whole set of diverse challenges and interesting opportunities in this field. Um, they have all independently and ambitiously developed their own interests in law and AI, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to join them tonight and to hear about what they've been up to. So without further ado, even though I might actually be slightly early, which is almost shocking, um, I will kick into uh, the presentation number one, HSF International EMOOT, Herbert Smith Freehills International EMOOT. And the presenter for our first presentation is Andrew Ray, who is a Bachelor of Laws Honours student and a Bachelor of Science student and a member of the, of the ANU team, which won that moot. I'll pass over to Andrew right now. Fantastic. And thank you, Will, uh, for the introduction there. Uh, and I think I'd mirror the comments that um, perhaps in some ways, I think the centrality of PIPs, uh, perhaps influence on technology law, uh, at least as it speaks to student involvement, is likely to be a very central theme looking down the program tonight. Uh, now, just before I kick off uh, my presentation, although noting that the time is obviously currently running, um, I'd just like to apologize on behalf of my teammate, Javier Cross, who was not able to make it tonight uh, as he's attending a firm event. Uh, and that is the reason that unfortunately you all have to listen to me uh, twice in the program. Uh, otherwise, Javier would have been taking um, this presentation. I'd also just like to take the opportunity to thank our coach, uh, Dylan Thampapale, uh, for his assistance uh, in preparing for the HSF EMOOT competition. Uh, and of course, uh, note that Pip Ryan was in fact the organizer and founder uh, of the mooting competition, although I would note that it didn't give us any favors in terms of moot timing or schedule, um, because uh, Australia, because as an international competition, unfortunately, Australia uh, hit perhaps the tail end, uh, which led to us mooting quite late into the evening. Um, uh, and then of course, the, the scheduling over summer was, was also excellent. Um, but um, very briefly for the presentation tonight, um, I'm gonna to be answering th three key questions. The first is what is a computational moot? The second is what the HSF moot entailed? Uh, and the third is what is e-mooting and is it better than traditional mooting? Uh, where I'm gonna make a compelling case, hopefully to, to round out that presentation. Um, now, before I answer the first question, I'll just do a little bit of background on the competition. So the 2020 HSF International Computational Law EMOOT, uh, which is quite a mouthful to say in job interviews, was the inaugural, student, uh, was the inaugural international compu uh, competition launched this year in a partnership between Herbert Smith Freehills, the Australian National University and Singapore Management University. Uh, and really the problem uh, that the MOOT was focused on really addressed two key questions. The first was whether a, person, uh, whether a person's online pseudonym uh, could be defamed. And the second was whether blockchain, uh, or more specifically cryptocurrency, at least as the way that we structured our submissions, um, is property for the purposes of a knowing receipt claim under equity. And uh, I think as a testament to, to PIP, uh, that second question in particular uh, at the start when it was posed was actually quite an open and unanswered question. Uh, and yet over the three and a half, four months of the comp competition, we actually had a series of court decisions handed down in Singapore, uh, the United Kingdom, France, I believe, and New Zealand, uh, and then Australia as well, right at the end, uh, all of which kind of pushed beyond any doubt uh, that in fact, uh, cryptocurrency could, at least in certain circumstances, 
be considered property uh, for actions like knowing receipt claims, uh, which led to a situation where we actually had to moot on a now very settled issue uh, in the grand final, uh, where it was our job to convince the judges that in fact it was not a very settled issue and was still open to the court to take a different approach. Uh, now, turning to the first question, uh, what is a computational moot? Um, now, Pip might disagree with me, but uh, I have the floor here. Uh, so broadly, in my view, a computational moot is quite simply a moot that is focused on a computational or technology law mooting problem. Uh, and as a part of that, at least part of the focus uh, of the moot and of the you know, interaction that students have to engage in is actually the technical knowledge underpinning the particular problem or the technology or the service. Uh, so in this case, that was in relation to the nature of social media networks uh, in modern times, uh, and as of course, um, how blockchain and cryptocurrency actually work. Um, and as part of this as well, teams don't just have to engage with legal issues, they also have to deal with the underpinning policy rationales or the policy positions uh, as to why exactly the law should be taken in a particular direction. And that is because what we're often trying to do in these cases um, is deploy, you know, settled legal principles, uh, in this case, the second limb from Barnes and Addy, to a completely novel problem, and that is whether or not uh, cryptocurrency should be considered property, something that the court uh, did not even have in its mind, or indeed any, you know, it didn't even have the precursor technology in its mind when it handed down that original decision. Now, in terms of the second question, I've already outlined uh, what the problem was, but quite quickly, the way that the competition was structured, uh, teams had to progress through two rounds. The first round was a written submission uh, stage where you know, every team was invited to submit written submissions, and these were then ranked um, accordingly. And from that, uh, the teams that would progress through to the oral advocacy rounds um, were selected, and each university that took part was guaranteed at least one team progressing to the oral advocacy round. So uh, if there was just one team from your uni going, uh, taking part in that written round, you'd know that you were going through. Uh, but if there was more than one team, as is the case for ANU, uh, it was in fact a, a competition, uh, a, almost an internal competition to see who would put, provide the best written submissions. Uh, and so from that, they drew the best teams in the world uh, into this uh, mooting environment. Now, finally, and noting that I have just over a minute left, uh, what is e-mooting and is it better than actual mooting? Uh, well, e-mooting is very simply uh, mooting over an online platform, which is kind of what everyone's doing now, uh, except of course, everyone's cameras would be on um, and you'd, get, you'd obviously be presenting before a judge. Now, in my view, there's a number of key benefits that e-mooting has uh, and the main one is accessibility. So none of the teams had to travel to a central location in order to take part in this competition. Uh, and I'll note that this one occurred before COVID, uh, you know, uh, over the COVID period, I think every mooting competition either went online um, or imploded, uh, for want of a better word. Um, but this competition took part um, before we had the international lockdowns. Um, but broadly, the key benefits of e-mooting are the accessibility and the ability for students to be able to compete from countries that they wouldn't otherwise be able to compete against. And it really was a privilege and pleasure to be able to learn from some of the top mooters from the United Kingdom and New Zealand uh, in particular, uh, as well as places such as Hong Kong and India, uh, and teams that we would never ordinarily be able to compete against. Uh, now, noting that I believe I'm bang on my time limit here, I would just note that we were uh, remarkably fortunate to be able to progress all the way through uh, the competition um, and did indeed manage to succeed, I believe, in convincing the bench in the grand final that whether cryptocurrency is property is not a settled question. And it was perfectly open for the court in this particular case to take a different view uh, to the Singapore High Court, the Singapore Supreme Court, um, and the, the UK uh, High Court as well. Um, and with that, I believe I pass back over to Pip, uh, unless we take questions, um, which I, I'm going first, so I'm not actually entirely uh, sure what the process is here. Um, I'm happy just to say right here, Andrew, thank you very much for kicking off so beautifully. No questions, um, although I wish I had a right of reply, but I'll have to hold on to that. We're going to hand over to Will, because Will is actually introducing the first six presenters. I'll do the second six. So thank you, Andrew. Great start. Really enjoyed that. Over to you, Will. Yes, fantastic. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, our next presentation is on a matter very dear to my heart and a, 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 a matter upon which I've spent far too much time working in the last two years, which means my family probably hates it. Um, judicial review of automated decisions in government. Uh, by Angus Voss, Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Laws with Honours student, and I can't wait to hear um, what Angus has to say. Thanks a bunch, Will. Hi there. Uh, yeah, so my name's Angus, a recent graduate of 
doing a Bachelor of Law and a Bachelor of Science majoring in Computer Science. Um, before I begin my presentation, I just want to echo Pip and acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal peoples. Um, it is upon their ancestral lands that the ANU was built. So, yeah, so basically earlier this year, I decided that it would be a great idea to write a research paper looking at the administrative law around judicial review and whether it could apply to automated decisions made in government and under Dr. Pitt Ryan's supervision. So the core question of this research was whether our current law enabled an automated decision to be judicially reviewed. Now, this is a key question which I believe is facing our democracy, with government increasingly seeking to use automated decisions to make decisions on its behalf. As the use of these systems grows, we need to be clear about how we can ensure that our systems of ensuring accountability keep pace with the developments in actual government administration. So just to kind of start at the beginning, um, an automated decision is a decision which has been made by an automated system using basically a set of preset logical rules without direct human involvement at the time of the decision. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are many contentious views on what exactly is an automated decision, but that's kind of the definition I've adopted. It's basically just a decision made by a computer, and in this case, it's um, specifically within government. So they've been used within government for years, since back in the 1990s. Um, a 2004 review of their use by the Administrative Review Council found that 14 agencies had utilized them to assist in decision making. However, it's really only a more recent development where they've actually been used to make a decision on behalf of a government agency with legislative authority and all those other things to enable them to make that decision. Um, so last year, one of these was in the headlines. Um, many of you would have heard of the uh, robo debts fiasco. Basically, this was an instance where an automated system issued debt recovery notices after matching their Centrelink data with income reporting data obtained from the ATO. It used a particular algorithm which kind of averaged their income over the whole year. And it was this algorithm which came with a whole host of problems. In fact, the federal court found, not actually in a decision, but more just in they were finding they were doing, that the algorithm was insufficient to determine that a debt existed. And as such, any debt raised with it as its sole basis was invalid. Now, another automated decision maker that many of you will have experienced if you've traveled overseas is the SmartGate system. It matches your face against your passport and decides whether to admit you into Australia. That's actually an automated decision maker making a decision. Now, if a negative result is returned, it sends you over to a human decision maker, but it still is able to make that positive decision. So how do we ensure the accountability of these systems? Um, traditionally, we have the avenues of merits review, judicial review, and the Commonwealth Ombudsman. Now, both merits review and uh, the Commonwealth Ombudsman have been kind of brought in to review basically automated decisions. However, what's interesting is we have no published decision of a merits review of an automated decision because there's never actually been appealed and hence published. Um, Similarly, we don't actually have a published case where judicial review of an automated decision has been undertaken. So in fact, this has created a bunch of uncertainty in particular regarding whether a decision made by an automated system can be considered a decision under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. And that's kind of the key question of all the research I was doing. And this was due to an interpretation by the courts of the term decision as it's used in legislation. Basically, in the 2018 case, Pinterich versus the Deputy Commissioner of Taxation, a decision was described as requiring a mental process of reaching a conclusion. This was adopting interpretation first put forward in the case Semunius in 1999. And um, since then, both the Human Rights Commission and the Australian Law Reform Commission have released papers which suggest that this decision may exclude automated decisions from judicial review. Um, with all due respect, I, I kind of disagree with that position. Um, and as many of my friends have found out, I'm often more than happy to describe in detail the full extent of the case law regarding this issue and the legal minute of this question when given the opportunity to. I'll spare everyone that. Um, but in summary, Pinterest was just not a case which determined the extent to which a decision was reviewable under the ADJR. Rather, in both it and Semunigas, the courts were seeking to determine whether a decision had taken place under a particular act. And that was what I believe to be a process of statutory interpretation of that act, not the ADJR. And furthermore, just adopting that interpretation of the ADJR would run contrary to its very purpose. Um, it was created to provide a simpler means of obtaining review by the courts of decisions made by government. And that was kind of stated by the Kerr Committee, which initiated the ADJR's creation. Now, separate from all those arguments, 
what I'd really like to extract from this is that while I believe we have an avenue for judicial review of automated decisions available, it's not a clear cut thing. And as a result, we currently have a very large gap in our system of administrative law, which only gets wider as the government continues to utilize more and more automated systems to make decisions. This has an effect on, on people like you and me. Um, last year, government announced they will repay $721 million in debt, which had been raised illegally through the robo debt system. Now, without judicial review, we have limited ways to prevent this overreach and to ensure that these decisions are being made legally. Um, and in the meantime, until either legislation or court clears this up, this is just a really important area to be aware of and a, a gap to highlight so that we can kind of push for it to be resolved. So yeah, that's kind of a brief outline of what the issues are in this area and a kind of suggestion of what my view is on that, but really interesting and really encourage people to look at it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angus. That's just fascinating. And um, one number for people to bear in mind, there were 353,000 uh, um, robo-debt letters sent out unlawfully. If each one of those letters was sent to a different um, person, then more than 1% of the Australian population received an unlawful robot-generated um, debt letter, which is quite sobering. Um, our third presentation, is by Corin Demio, uh, and the title is Perspective, Perspectives on Children's Rights in the Digital World, Consent, Freedoms, Justice. Corin is a Bachelor of International Relations, Bachelor of Laws, Honours Student, and will be speaking with Marin Chu, a Bachelor of Criminology, Bachelor of Laws, Honours Student, and Priyanka Toma, a Bachelor of International Relations and Bachelor of Laws, Honours Student. I pass the mic to them. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as interns with the Mindarin Foundation, we are currently writing a UN submission for the Committee on the Rights of the Child on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. For this presentation, though, we're going to be using to illustrate some of the issues we have been examining. While our research focus has been on children, a lot of the problems in the digital world impact us too. Think of Google as a library, and when you enter into this digital world, cameras track your every action. The shelves are full of books that have been approved by the gatekeepers of knowledge, yet strangers follow you from aisle to aisle, instructing you as to which books to check out, often prioritizing paid content and which to leave behind, compromising your right information. For many of us, we've never thought about whether this is acceptable. There are three key issues that this highlights. One, content moderation, what is being shown. Two, content personalization, what is being suggested. And three, surveillance capitalism, how your data is. The fact is you are being surveilled. You are being tracked by Google. Let your personal information, your history, your location, all is even across other digital platforms that you thought were unrelated. This accumulation of your data is an inherent component of their business model. Your data becomes their wealth. It helps predict and monitor human behavior as a means of market control. You are the product and advertisers are the purchasers. Google can even trade and sell this information to third parties, some that could have, have the capacity to harm you in the future. This phenomenon has been described as surveillance capitalism, of which Google is the pioneer. The promise of their free search engine comes at the cost of you losing your privacy. But Google is not alone. This business model is now what characterizes almost all the contemporary digital platforms we use today. The next key point I'd like you to turn your mind to is understanding that the boundaries of your accessible knowledge is fenced off by these companies. Companies like Google set the safety standards for themselves. They govern themselves and they enforce breaches to these standards themselves. When you search in Google images, you never notice what you don't see and what you don't want to see. Things like child pornography, gra graphic violence and abuse. And most of us are okay with this. But have you ever wondered ever... what you don't see, but you would like to see? This lack of transparency when removing content and their inconsistent methodology in doing so certainly should worry you. We see this often with channels on YouTube taken down or videos arbitrarily demonetized. This highlights the lack of regulation and the lawlessness in these systems. Are private companies really best placed to take on the responsibility of deciding where our access to knowledge begins and ends? 
this is an example of company deciding what books are available in a library. Next, we'll look at how these books are recommended to you. And this is what we refer to as content personalization. This consists of recommender systems, search engines, and targeted advertising, rely on, relying on algorithms to guide your consumption and inform your choices. Google creates a user model based on all the information is collected based off you, which is then used to predict what information you like and what it wishes for you to see. and how it actually works. What you don't know is that these options usually protect content. Unfortunately, we seem to be having some technical difficulties um, with that last microphone, um, and we might but just Orient let the but panelists Orient try to and... particular search options. Yes. Finally, Google search engines reflect the biases of its commercial partners and advertisers, and reinforce oppressive ideas and stereotypes among users. So, we're going to audience participation to emphasize this point. If you can look over, sorry, our thing is kind of screwing up, but we're going to get there. <laughs> God, technology is amazing. So, <laughs> you can jump your laptops or your phones and search professionals and then go and search up unprofessional hairstyles. And what do you see? Could you please repeat the question? I, did we, what we you didn't quite should hear the first notice part of it. is that the algorithm prefers white people's hair to be professional and black people's natural hair to be unprofessional. In such ways, Google manipulates our ideas, decisions, and beliefs about the world without our awareness or permission. In doing so, search engines such as Google serve as a poor proxy for a public library. So, are there any alternatives to Google's search engine? Well, we believe a new search engine should be created altogether. As an example, Sophia Noble has designed the which Maureen will kindly display for us on her screen. Thank you for that, Maureen. Thanks. Essentially, this transparent interface delivers search results in the form of a color wheel, symbolizing a controlled set of categories. You can notice see the entire indexable web and select categories of interest by clicking a color. Through this process, you can safely find important intersections between topics. So, by reimagining what search engines could be, we can look towards a future that is empowering for our digital lives and a profit maximizing system designed against us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priyanka, Maureen, and Corin. Um, there were some technical difficulties, but what I heard was absolutely fantastic. Um, it's so good to um, know that there are people who have your passion um, and your technical understanding and your moral grounding dealing with these very complicated issues. So well done to the three of you. Fabulous presentation, despite occasionally the tech technical difficulties, which is very normal in this world of um, Zoom only seminars. Um, presentation four is Remedying Cyber Stalking, the Scope and Limits of Civil Law in Australia, presented by Jacqueline Hickman a Bachelor of Laws Honours student. Over to you, Jacqueline. Just clarifying, I think I've unmuted myself. I hope I have. I hope I don't too have technical difficulties. Um, so in the first semester of this year, I completed a supervised paper concerning uh, cyber stalking under the supervision of Daniel Stewart. And so as a very quick introduction, I'd just like to acknowledge that there really is no universally agreed upon definition of cyber stalking and my, my paper and, and myself, I take a rather broad approach as to what it is um, and, and define it broadly speaking as the receipted, uh, the, I guess the repeated pursuit involving electronic or internet capable devices. And kind of as a consequence of this kind of course of conduct, a few things generally occur. Ah. 
I started my video, apologies. The irony, I'm so sorry, there we are. Um, so a couple of things happened. So a victim's uh, privacy is violated, quite obviously. Uh, in many cases, uh, it infringes the victim's right to personal safety. And, and ultimately, and, and the statistics and the empirical evidence is showing that it can cause severe and protracted emotional distress. And so we've probably heard things in the media of, of cyber stalking, uh, particularly with the emergence of, of Teslas and uh, new cars and, and new technologies. Um, another very common, uh, common one is spyware software and keystroke hardware uh, to hack into phones uh, as an associate at the family court. It's something that's very uh, pertinent in our work to identify domestic violence. So technology facilitating domestic violence and cyber stalking being a broad uh, stroke um, course of conduct that that umbrellas a lot a lot of conduct that we all would have heard of, and and my paper really and I would like to point this out very obviously as a very important point. While ironically my paper says remedying cyber stalking, I by no means believe that the civil law is a remedy to the course of conduct that is cyber stalking or any type of technology facilitated domestic violence. I fully appreciate that it is a prohibitively expensive course of um, approach to addressing and to holding somebody accountable and to seeking damages um, and I understand that many people that face uh, such behaviour do not have the means or all the people that they will be suing do not have the means for it to be an appropriate response. What I was looking at however is that many commentators indeed the ALRC have said that broadly um, Australia and the civil law in Australia affords piecemeal, indirect or quite frankly incidental protection to the personal safety and privacy interests of individuals who have been cyber stalked. And I guess the mantra and the line of argument has run for many a year that unless it fits into a particular pigeonhole of say nuisance or, or trespass or assault um, or breach of confidence, which is a very interesting existing cause of action, that simply there is no remedy for such behaviour and that they, the people can get away with quite egregious forms of, particularly in my interest, uh, domestic and family violence. Um, and I, I, I did, I looked into it in my paper, I analysed all said causes of action and I got to a point where I began to believe uh, the ALRC and I looked into uh, a tort of privacy uh, quite deeply and I, I wrote quite extensively about it and while I wasn't proposing to create a workable tort of privacy, although I think Daniel would have appreciated that, um, I, I did start to realise two things. Number one, uh, unfortunately, the UK, New Zealand and America and the jurisprudence there and, and the many a case I read illustrated that it might, necess might not necessarily be the fix-all. Uh, without getting into it, um, it, it might, a, a victim of cyber stalking might not necessarily be able to successfully um, bring a cause of action on the basis of that they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. There are many a case that uh, connect the concept of privacy to a physical location. And as we all well know with technology, with phones, with cars, uh, with the kitten caboodle and everything, a part of it, that we're not always in our shower when our privacy is being invaded. And while it's very contentious and there's definitely shifts, um, there is a strong argument to say that in Australia, we already have um, not, not much judicial interest in, in, in a tort of privacy, but moreover that it might not necessarily provide a remedy for uh, people who, who suffer. Um, and I was reading, as everybody should, um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and Lena Gay Meets, although I expect everyone has, and, and the judgment of course, uh, their honours Gummo and Hain, who were saying that we should augment privacy protection just through um, I guess the, the traditional process of adapting causes of action. And I thought, well, no, that's pointless because none of them work, except I didn't read all. And one was the Wilkinson and Dantan tort. So an 1897 case by Justice uh, Judge Wright, pardon me, in um, England, and something I quite frankly had only heard of in passing. And, and they could be on the money. Um, so, and that's what I argued. I said that this, this tort in Wilkinson, um, which at its very heart is says that doing an act that's calculated to cause harm is actionable if harm results um, is potentially something that can address what many perpetrators of cyber stalking seek to threaten, which is the personal and emotional security of an individual. And noting that I have very short amount of time without going into Wilkinson and downtown. It is an 1897 case. And so when we're looking at new and exciting and novel uh, 
situations like I was talking that is horrifying and out of our depth. Sometimes look backwards, there might be something on the shelf that a judge can turn to to address a very important issue rather than always turning to something equally as novel. So that's my mantra. Um, and, and please do read the case at some point. I'd like to hear it in the, in the cases in the future. Please. <laughs> it's a wonderful case. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, spoken like a true common lawyer, which is great because they're the ones that we train up at the ANU. Um, good on you. Fantastic presentation. Great to hear about your work. Very interesting yeah. indeed. Um, presentation five is another presentation by Andrew Ray, uh, who was our first speaker. And this is on the ANU Hackathon. And I will pass the uh, microphone back to Andrew. Andrew, floor's yours. Uh, thank you again, Will. Uh, now, this was a little bit of a tricky topic to approach because uh, there's actual multiple uh, different events that fall within uh, the ANU Hackathon. Uh, so I thought I'd take a broad brush approach here um, and once again, uh, answer three key questions, which is just my preferred format for this type of talk, clearly. Uh, the first is what is a hackathon? The second is how is ANU involved in legal hackathons nationally? Uh, and the third uh, is how you hack a hackathon, uh, by which I mean how you turn yourself into such a, a hack of hackathons that you just compete in multiple and do, do very, very well, which, which has been the approach um, of the ANU. Now, in response to the first question, uh, this is actually the first thing you ever get asked if you have a hackathon on your CV uh, when you go for a job interview, uh, because quite often uh, the, the person asking or the person running the interview is quite curious because they haven't really seen a lot of these before, uh, certainly not on a legal CV. Uh, and, and a common question is, uh, I, did you learn how to hack into computer databases? Uh, why is that on your CV and how is that useful to us as a law firm? And also, hang on, you're, you're a law student. Uh, where on earth did you learn these skills? Uh, now, of course, the correct response would be you learned them from the ANU College of Law because we've got fantastic educators here. Um, but uh, you, you, you immediately face, you're immediately sort of put on the back foot. And I, and I think the real problem here is that we really should rename hackathons. Um, but simply put, a hackathon is effectively team-based problem solving uh, within a very limited time frame. So traditionally teams would get somewhere between uh, 48 and you know, 64 hours over two or three days uh, where they are uh, traditionally locked in a room, uh, although in 2020 it's all done online, uh, where you're locked in a room uh, with just a team of five or six uh, students or, or early career professionals, uh, and you need to really work together as a team in order to solve a particular problem that's been given to you. And in a legal space, it's often a legal technology problem, or how, or sorry, uh, by that I mean, you know, how you can assist practitioners to work with existing technologies, or it's actually how you can take a common everyday problem, uh, for example, how exactly you could assist tenants to deal with uh, new COVID emergency legislation that they quite, po quite possibly don't understand and need to be able to interact with really quickly, and how to provide a legal technology solution that can help them solve their problem while complying with all relevant uh, state, federal, or, or territory law, depending on, depending on what applies. Um, so really, it's, it's not so much about hacking into anything. It's really more about um, solving this particular problem and then the end of the event pitching your solution to a panel of judges, um, of which you know you generally have an industry practitioner, an academic, uh, and then a third other seat, because you know we have to have a, an odd number of um, odd number of judges. Now, in terms of how ANU is involved, ANU is involved in a series of different capacities. So the first is that we enter uh, law student teams in a number of national hackathons. Uh, and I had the privilege of being selected to be part of the 2019 Innovate Law Hackathon that was run by the Law Society of New South Wales up in Sydney. Uh, so we sent a team there in 2018 and 2019. The competition wasn't held this year. Uh, and in both, uh, in both 2018 and 2019, ANU was successful uh, in winning the competition, or sorry, more accurately, the, a team with a majority ANU law students was successful in winning in winning the um, winning the competition. I'll note that our 2019 team had a legal practitioner um, who who uh, is currently at Allen's um, on the team as well. Um, uh, but in addition to sending teams, the ANU this year has also started running hackathons, um, and we also host. Uh, hackathons um, that are being run by external organizations. Um, and really, uh, the, the reason for this is that uh, I think PIP 
just says yes too often when you send her an email uh, and has been very generous and gracious in, in providing time, space uh, and her expertise to people wanting to run these events, which is why the ANU started to take a more active role in facilitating and running them, providing additional opportunities for students, not only to compete, but to assist behind the scenes in the preparation for uh, or coaching of particular teams. Um, so, like I mentioned, uh, the ANU team has had a clean run uh, at the New South Wales Law Society Hackathon. Um, if we keep winning, there's a suggestion that we'll no longer be invited to the New South Wales competition and the ACT will be excluded, uh, but I think that's a good problem to have. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the ANU team uh, won the uh, ACT round um, of the, the Legal Forecast National Hackathon in 2019, and then also won the national round. Uh, so, you know, still undefeated on that level as well. Uh, and then finally, the ANU team won the Australian round of an international legal hackathon earlier this year. Um, and then in the ANU JOLT hackathon, we placed third. Uh, so as we can see, the ANU has a traditional history of doing very well in these competitions. And I really think it comes down to this final question, which is how do you hack a hackathon? Um, now, the, 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 you know, the, the quite short blase answer is you have Pip Ryan in your corner. Um, but the secondary answer is that you go into that hackathon with a very clear strategy and a very clear plan and delineated roles for each of your team members so that you're not wasting any of that time. Because you've only got, you know, somewhere between 36 to 64 hours to solve the problem, you really don't have any time to be, you know, faffing around wasting time in meaningless discussion. And what you really need to be doing is hitting the ground running with clearly delineated roles and responsibilities that each of the team members can immediately work in. And you need to know how those roles and responsibilities interact. Now, unfortunately, I've run out of time to give you the key five or six roles, uh, but definitely stay, oh, uh, yes, I've just been asked a quick question. I will give that answer and then hand over. Uh, and the question was, could I give an example of a problem posed in a hackathon? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, so the one that I mentioned earlier in relation to the COVID-19 emergency legislation for, uh, to protect tenants was the problem posed to the, by the ANU Journal of Law and Technology Hackathon this year. Um, and a secondary example would be the problem that we tackled in the hackathon last year. And that was how can uh, you or the team uh, assist legal practitioners uh, to navigate the emerging legal technology market? Um, and to that, we, we developed a repository um, of apps. Um, noting that my time has elapsed, I will now hand over back to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, so much. Um, presentation six is the ANU Journal of Law and Technology, or JOLT, which deserves the exciting name, which its acronym suggests. It, it deserves a level of excitement its acronym suggests. Our presenters are Jacinta McGindley and Amina Sotenbawa, uh, Bachelor of Honours in International Relations and Law and editor and co-founders of ANU JOLT. I'll pass the microphone over right now. Thank you, Will, for that introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, as Will said, my name is Amina Sultanbauer and Jacinta and I are the co-founders and current editors-in-chief at ANU Journal of Law and Technology. We are both incredibly excited to be here and present to you the platform that we have established over the last year. We would also like to thank Pip for incredible support as one of the journal's academic advisors and her constant encouragement through this initiative. Our rationale behind establishing JOLT was to create a platform where academics, students, experts, and professionals could publish works addressing the intersection between law and technology. There is no doubt that this intersection is of growing relevance and our main aim was to involve ANU in the space by publishing academic works. When we first pitched the, pitched the idea to the College of Law in July 2019, there were only three other, other Australian journals of law and technology, and none that covered a similar scope to us. We believed that the relatively small amount of scholarship at the time gave ANU a unique opportunity to establish a publication of significance. Student-run law journals in this space are pretty rare. However, we believe that students were also well-equipped to navigate complex legal manuscripts and were the ones most likely to be impacted by new technological transformations in the legal industry. We can definitely all relate to this now with the dramatic changes that COVID has brought and how future lawyers will have to adapt to running matters over Zoom, for example. COVID also brought about interesting discussions which made our publications this year even more exciting. We've published the inaugural volume this year with two issues already available online. JOLT covers an expansive range of topics, including data protection, artificial intelligence, online legal services, and Jacinta will discuss one of our pieces later. 
we are able to publish about such pertinent issues in the space because of our amazing editorial board. The editorial board comprises of students, academic advisors, experts in the field, sponsors and peer reviewers. The editors and sub-editors of the board are generally later year A and U law students who are responsible for editing manuscripts and liaising with authors and reviewers. A and U law students are also responsible for the research, marketing and financial aspects of the journal. In addition to this, JOLT utilises a blind peer-to-peer -peer review system, which ensures that our pieces are academically sound. This incredible network has assisted us in creating effective processes to ensure that our biannual publications are timely and are making a valuable contribution to this evolving space. Um, I will pass it on to Jacinta now. Thanks, Amina. Um, there are a number of ways students can get involved in the ANU Journal of Law and Technology. We encourage students to apply for positions on the editorial board. We also maintain a regular blog that posts articles discussing interesting developments in the legal tech space. For example, we've recently posted about the RoboDebt class action and the broader implications this lawsuit may have for automated technology in government. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we also accept student work for the biannual issues of the journal. In our last issue, we published a piece written by Jonathan Lim, an ANU Master of Legal Practice student specializing in block blockchain technology. Jonathan's piece is about harmonizing digital identity solutions through distributed ledger technology. He explains that individuals have increasingly fallen victim to the fragmentation of their personal data across various service providers who then use this information to deliver services and drive profit. However, distributed ledger technology enables us to create a safe, secure and trusted digital identity framework. Indeed, storing personal data on a blockchain gives individuals control over their identity with the individual, not a centralized authority, controlling the cryptographic key that enables access to their digital identity data. This notion of self-sovereign identity stands in stark contrast to the disparate centralized identity systems maintained by governments that are often inefficient, lacking in privacy controls and vulnerable to cyber attacks. Self-sovereign identity can strengthen compliance with legal requirements through the elimination of intermediaries and by ensuring cryptographically provable verification and consent for accessing data. Its real-world applications may help identify refugees and stateless persons and support the administration of welfare services. Please have a read of Jonathan Lim's article and many other excellent papers papers that address the critical intersection of law and technology at anujolt.org. We encourage advanced ANU students to submit their work. We also encourage you to follow the ANU Journal of Law and Technology on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Over the last year, JOLT has evolved dramatically, and we have increased our presence not only at ANU, but across other universities. Just this month, we organized a national hackathon which allowed law students across six Australian universities to develop an app aimed at assisting vulnerable ten tenants during emergency situations such as COVID and bushfires. Through events like the Hackathon, a new Jolt hopes more conversations are sparked about this exciting area. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much, Jacinta and Amina. Um, having been involved in uh, legal journals in a number of different countries and a number of different universities, I'm so impressed with what you've achieved. It's extraordinary and I encourage anybody else who has similarly ambitious entrepreneurial ideas to go for it and to develop it along the lines of JOLT because it's a really, really impressive project. Well done, both of you. Um, Thanks, Will. No sweat. I will now pass over to Pip, who will be doing the one minute buffering for the remainder of the presentations. Uh, Pip, it's all yours. Thanks, Will. Um, and just before um, you depart, because I believe you may have to go, I think you've got a deadline, but before we lose you, I just wanted to say thank you for that amazing phone conversation we had back in May when we thought, wouldn't it be cool to end 2020 with a showcase of how amazing our students are? And I think the first six presentations really highlight um, what an amazingly productive year it's been. So the next six are also very, very exciting and it's a privilege to be able to present them. So thank you, Will, for presenting the first six. Um, okay, so this next group gets eight minutes, which is um, unprecedented, but I think we're doing quite well for time. And the reason why is there's eight of them. So we just wanted to give them a little bit more time so that everybody can say something about this project. Um, and this is presentation number seven. 
This is the ANU National Judicial College of Australia App Development Project, and this team has been working on a project they call Writing Better Judgments, and they are developing an app that they're going to tell us about. This team includes Jessica, Dominique, Lucia, Neil, Peyton, Emily, Jan, and Zach. So over to you guys. Thank you, Pip. So my name is Jess, and I'm part of the student intern team who who are building an app for the National Judicial College of Australia. And as Pip said, we are a large team. And as you can see, our roles are on the screen there. Dom and myself are the project managers. Zach and Jan are our app developers. Peyton and Emily are the quality assurance officers. And Neil and Lucia are the client liaison officers. And of course, our brilliant supervisor, Dr. Pip Ryan. So throughout the past semester, we have worked with the National Judicial College and two Supreme Court judges Justice Schmidt and Justice Kellum to produce an app for their Writing Better Judgments program that will ultimately assist judges in all national jurisdictions in their writing um, practice. Using Neota Logic as our platform and exploring the relevance of technology in facilitating access to justice, we have designed an app that streamlines judgment writing around the concept justice delayed is justice denied. Zach will now talk about Neota Logic. Thanks, Jess. The team used a system called Near the Logic to build the app for the NGSCA, which is a platform that I'm sure many of you are familiar with if you've done litigation and dispute management last semester. Essentially, Near provides a platform that allows users to create apps without the need to code whatsoever. One of the benefits that we found using the software was its user-friendly interface. It made the entire development process accessible to us, um, especially because we have no background in um, computer science or coding whatsoever. So it acts as a single platform for automation, which allowed us to compile and synthesize our documents and workflows into one spot. The platform is flexible, intuitive, and provided us with a great amount of control over what we wanted to create, which was exactly what we wanted when we were making this app for the NJCA. I'll now, I'll now hand over to Peyton, who will speak more about our task and the purpose of our app. Thanks, Zach. So I'm just going to briefly introduce our task and the purpose of our app. So our team was tasked with building an app that would support judges in high volume jurisdictions to write their judgments. The app aims to simplify the existing drafting process and reduce the risk of inadvertent errors in judgments. The app was also required to support access to justice. And our team did this through the inclusion of a flesh Kincaid language assessment tool, which informs judges of the reading level required to comprehend their judgments. This tool, in conjunction with the NJCA Writing Better Judgments program, will encourage judges to use plain English in their judgments. This can help make these more accessible to legal practitioners, legal academics, students, and the public. It also promotes transparency and accountability within the judiciary. I will now hand over to Neil, who will discuss the functions of the app in more detail. Thanks, Peyton. So the key function of our app is to enable judges to draft a judgment for a final hearing ideally in a single sitting. The app supports clarity and structure in judgment writing by stepping the user through a series of questions based on the legal reasoning process. For example, the, ad, the app will ask the user to input their responses to threshold legal questions, the issues for consideration, relevant case law, application of the law to the facts, and finally, the reasons for their decision. Once the user completes these question, th sorry, this question flow, the app will automatically populate a template Word document. The app will even update the formatting of the document to get it as close to a finished product as possible. However, the Word document is unlocked so the user can make further edits as they see fit. I will now hand over to Emily to discuss the metadata that the app collects. Thanks, Neil. The app will automatically collect valuable metadata. It will note how many judges use the app in any given period of time. The app will also date stamp when the file number is initially entered and when the draft judgment is generated. This will provide an indication of the overall time taken to produce any draft judgment. This metadata will also provide insight into how many judges are using the app on average each month. Such metadata will be sent to a register hosted by the NJCA to help them assess the usefulness of the app and to measure judicial time management. As no data is stored on the app itself, there are limited data privacy and security concerns relating to the collection of this metadata. I'll now hand over to Dominique to discuss our readability tool. Thank you, Emily. The app also incorporates a function that allows judges to measure how easy it is to read the judgments. 
Using a scientific formula called a Flesh Kincaid score, we created a macro tool on Microsoft Word to allow users to obtain their score with just one click of a button. Judges can know when they should adjust their writing style. For example, if their judgments only um, uh, can only be understood by a university graduate, but a party involved has only attended high school or speaks English as a second language. With this simple yet useful feature, we aim to help make the law more accessible to the general public. And now Jan will finish up by telling you more about where we see this project going from here. Thank you, Dom. So to conclude, this app functions as a streamlining tool to expedite the judgment writing process, ensuring that justice is not delayed nor denied. But it also functions as a risk management tool to mitigate the risk of omitting procedural steps. While the app we have created is currently capable of formulating final judgments while promoting access to justice, we envision that this app could be adapted to have even more applications and uses in the future. For example, we view that this app could also be used by judges to manage applications for interlocutory injunctions. The app could allow judges to finalize their judgments more efficiently, which could be incredibly useful in dealing with urgent and serious matters. Ultimately, these are areas that we will continue exploring further before we compete in the 2021 Iron Tech Lawyer Competition hosted by the Georgetown Law School in Washington, DC, where we will be pitching our app to a panel of judges in competition with law schools from all over the world. Thank you so much for listening and I'll hand over back to Pip. Thank you very much. And I should just add for those who are listening and who are blown away by the members of this team who have developed an app for the Judicial College of Australia, none of the members of this team had developed apps prior to 2020. This is something that came about from a learning experience in a core subject here in the College of Law. So if you're thinking you're doing law somewhere, Keep, keep in mind these opportunities. So these are all undergraduate law or JD students in the ANU College of Law. Okay, presentation number eight, we have Vashnavi and she is going to talk to us about um, trust in AI systems. And Vashnavi is a, a, um, a student who's doing an LLM subject and that's where this particular topic um, emerges from. So let's just, yep, she's in, I can see you. Um, welcome, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Pip. Um, a very good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. Um, as Pip mentioned, my name is Vaishnavi Ravishanka. I'm gonna be talking about trust in AI systems. This is research work that I undertook as part of the course on AI law in society. I'm gonna start with a brief overview of AI systems. We'll then explore why trust matters in the context of AI systems and how it can be achieved or enhanced. Artificial intelligence explained simply is a collection of digital tools that enable machines to perceive, learn, and make decisions like humans. AI systems have evolved considerably over the last 70 years or so, from being logic-based systems to systems that can process, that can learn by processing data. Commonly, they use mathematical algorithms to recognize patterns and make decisions. They're being used in a number of different applications, recommendation systems on YouTube and Netflix, fraud detection for credit cards, search engines like Google, social media feeds, and voice assistants such as Siri. AI systems have changed the way we relate to the world. They not only function as tools, but also as interface through which we interact, perceive, and understand others and the environment surrounding us. As these systems become more pervasive, it's right to ask, how can they be developed in a way that works for our society? And how can they be made more trustworthy? A number of public perception surveys highlight reservations about certain types, certain aspects of AI development that influence social, ethical, and economic realms. But this doesn't automatically mean that governments must change perceptions of the public on all AI systems. What we should be working towards instead is to enhance appropriate trust. So there is no under-reliance or over-reliance on technology. I define appropriate trust in AI systems as reliance that can be justified when the nature and impact of the systems are considered. So why does appropriate trust matter? I provide three reasons. Firstly, economics. Studies indicate that trust is significant in enabling reliance on automation, its continued use, and therefore the pace of technology growth and development. Indeed, McKinsey estimates that AI growth can deliver GDP gain, global GDP gains of 13 trillion by 2030. Secondly, there are societal costs to disuse of AI technology that can be otherwise used to drive societal well-being. 
Consider, for example, the COVID tracing apps. Despite their usefulness in predicting infection rates, they haven't been adopted widely due to misgivings about privacy and data use. Thirdly, AI systems and the decisions that they generate could have implications for institutional trust, social cohesion, and our ability to discern truth. Think Cambridge Analytica, the use of bots to sway voters in the US elections, and the Brexit referendum. So does trust in AI always matter? I'd say yes. We don't fully recognize the impact of all the data points we give away online, knowingly or unknowingly, the future impact or the extent to which they may be used in high stake decisions to form our digital destiny. So AI systems must always be trusted appropriately, regardless of the scale of their immediate impact. So how can appropriate trust be achieved? I argue that we need to focus on humane, technological and environmental qualities. To improve trustworthiness of AI systems, social norms, core cultural beliefs, and humanity's best interests should be duly considered in the way AI develops, particularly as the technology scales and becomes a multiplier force. For instance, we need to address the systemic and unjustified biases that have crept into the functionality of the technology, either through the training data or in the way that AI system is deployed. Consider the functional disparities of the facial recognition systems as an example. They fail to recognize people with darker skin tones. We could tackle such issues by being more inclusive in our data collection and consultation processes and rigorous in terms of impact assessments and tests for unacceptable discrimination. Secondly, as AI systems become more sophisticated, we need to develop a common understanding of the objectives, intended use, the types of data being used and the inferences that an algorithm makes. Global agreement and convergence of regulations will be important in achieving a common set of expectations. We also need common metrics around performance, process and purpose of AI systems for stakeholders to evaluate technology in a consistent manner. Thirdly, trust in technology hinges on the integrity and reputation of the developers, designers and operators as much as the operational excellence of the system itself. The veil of secrecy in AI development is problematic. There have been instances where staff working on specific projects have become uncomfortable with the ethical ramifications of the AI systems they are developing. To avoid these situations, organizations will need to develop accountability frameworks, enhance whistleblowing procedures, and ensure adequate oversight at the board level. In concluding, I'd like to emphasize that the ethical dimensions of AI systems will grow even more important as they become more autonomous. To win our collective trust, AI systems will not only need to demonstrate functional reliability, but also be aligned with human values and contribute to a sustainable and prosperous world for all. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Vaishnavi. That's a wonderful conspectus of your research. And I have to say, one of the things I really love about that presentation is the focus that you have placed on this idea that trust is a relationship we have to have with technology, because I think it's very similar to what the community demands in its relationship with lawyers. Um, and I think you've really covered that whole notion of how humans are going to relate with the law and with technology and the role that trust is going to play. It was a, a really expert approach. And I loved the global voice you brought to it, a really global conspectus, which is very important when we think about Australia's place in um, leadership with trust systems. So that was um, incredibly eloquent. Thank you. Our next presentation, presentation number nine, is going to be from Malia. And Malia is going to be talk to us, uh, talking to us about deep fakes. I love Malia's slide. It's dynamic, which is unusual for lawyers. Um, we're usually quite static, I hate to say. But here we have Lauren Technology bringing us a really dynamic slide. And I know this presentation is going to be captivating. So the topic is deep, fa deep fake pornography, the new frontier of image-based sexual abuse. And I note, Malia, you will see, is actually a UTS student who has chosen to do this subject on a cross-institutional arrangement, which is welcome to students from most institutions around the world. So check it out. Malia, over to you. Thank you so much, Pip. Um, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to start off with a fairly philosophical question, which is, do we have a right to exist on the internet? Now, this is the question that my class, Me Too and the Law, was debating rigorously earlier this semester, ironically on Zoom, 
um, when we were discussing the spike in image-based sexual abuse that often accompanied women activists that were speaking out on the topic. Now, image-based sexual abuse, for anyone who doesn't know, covers a range of offences, including upskirting, revenge porn, non-consensual sharing of porn, and deep fake porn. And it uses technology to harass, harm, and defame victims. Now, COVID-19 has definitely moved our lives online. We learn, we work, we find out about different unis, we take different courses, all online. But abuse has also followed us online. And in fact, there has been a 245% increase in image-based sexual abuse since COVID-19 began. Now, deep fake pornography represents the newest offense um, on the block when it comes to image-based sexual abuse. Deep fake tech uses AI to create highly convincing videos. Say for instance, the, uh, one of the photos on my slide, which is Jim Carrey giving an interview as Alison Brie. And whilst there are many hilarious applications of deep fake, uh, deep fake technology, you can imagine that the tech is also used for much more sinister purposes. Um, it might come as no surprise to any of you that the term deep fake comes from the term fake news. And indeed, deep fake videos are often used uh, to, to create fake news, to sow political distrust, but they also have a big role uh, within image-based sexual abuse. 96% of deep fake content is deep fake pornography. Deep fake tech can take any photo of you online, either your photo that you've uploaded for your Zoom profile, your LinkedIn, your Facebook, and can superimpose you into a highly convincing pornography. And in fact, this was the case for one woman, one woman in Australia who had to change her name because her abusive partner created so many deep fake pornographies that that was all you could find when you Googled her original name. You can imagine that this tech presents quite a few challenges for lawmakers. From an investigative standpoint, victims simply do not know who's created the porn. Getting proof can be quite difficult, given that in most state jurisdictions, revenge porn is dealt with summarily. So investigative powers limited. Also from an orders standpoint, um, and orders are where you, the court can uh, basically order a site to take an image down. Many sites are hosted overseas. So jurisdictional limitations arise. Now, one Australian response, which I found really interesting is the ECF Safety Commissioner, which was originally set up to help uh, protect children um, from the internet. And it's a great example of a federal body expanding its powers to protect against a new technological threat. But it is limited in giving removal orders to sites that are hosted in Australia. Now, they're the legal challenges. And I've thought, and maybe you guys are thinking this too, that maybe there's no legal response to IBSA. And maybe it's just easier for us to all erase any content that we've ever had of our face on social media, delete our Instagrams, delete our Facebooks, and just remove ourselves from the internet entirely. But that's why I wanna circle back to that question, do we have a right to exist on the internet? I think COVID has shown us that we kind of do. We all need the internet to access and live our lives and to connect and network with others. And I think that means that as we come online, we also have, deserve protection to exist online safely and meaningfully. And as technology innovates, I think lawyers and lawmakers have an obligation to create for reforms that can meaningfully protect citizens from living that, that are living their lives online. Um, so in my research, I considered whether litigation of porn platforms and social media sites would be successful in the current legal landscape. I don't think it would, given that the laws, um, that many of these sites are still hosted in the US and sites in the US still enjoy quite antiquated protections from being litigated from the content posted by their users. However, there's been a mass, an explosion of revenge porn law reforms in Australia, California, America, um, and the UK, which does show, I think, that lawmakers do, at least in part, understand the importance of citizens existing in the online space. Now, as is often the case with research, I have come out of this with more questions than I answers. Um, but nevertheless, it's been a fascinating journey, um, learning about a technology that funnily enough, came about at the exact same time as I started my law degree, which is pretty scary to think about. Um, but nonetheless, it's been a, such a fantastic experience 
um, doing this at ANU and I would all strongly recommend everyone to go here. <laughs> I liked it, it was fun. Thank you, Malia. That was a wonderful presentation. And if I can just add, your course was convened by Dr. Sarah Steele, who's actually based at Cambridge University. So yeah. there's a very strong cross-institutional marrying here of amazing yeah, well, minds and platforms. And we do have the internet to thank for making that possible. Exactly. But I think what I really loved about your presentation and about your research is it is new and there are a lot of questions. And one of the hardest things to do is when there's a lack of existing scholarship, you have to take the law, like legislation and the common law, and by extension and analogy, try and draw out some really fundamental ideas about how the law should respond. And you did it expertly. It's not an easy thing to do. And I have no doubt Sarah would have supported you in that research, but it's also thanks to your incredible dedication to doing, doing the thing that's most interesting, which is reading up the work and then taking on, tackling something new. Yes. Um, so well done, congratulations, that was a wonderful presentation. Great. Okay, number 10, can't believe we're up to number 10. I'm really looking forward to Henry's presentation and we're about to go into space. So Henry, over to you, um, feel free to introduce your, the title of your topic. And just to note, Henry is doing a Master of International Law and Diplomacy at um, ANU. And um, I think my topic here, which is regulating sustainability in space, and you've got a comparison of national licensing laws for space activities. So, Henry, over to you. I'll, I'll unmute myself. That'll be a good way to start. Um, thank you, Pip, and everybody else who's presented so far. I've learned a lot already tonight, and I, um, I really hope that I can kind of uh, yeah, give back a little bit to, to, to the panelists and the presenters. So, um, yeah, as Pip said, my name's Henry. I'm a, an intern at the ANU Centre for International and Public Law. And I've been very privileged during my internship, I've been able to look um, or, or do some research indirectly for the Australian Space Agency. And what I've been doing is looking at the way that national licensing, uh, national licensing regimes and sort of the regulatory frameworks that exist in different countries uh, account for what we call space situational awareness, which more broadly relates to um, space sustainability. So uh, the, the ideally it's sort of getting an idea of the norms that exist in each country, um, whether that's from a legal perspective, a, a policy perspective, or whether it's from practice uh, in, in industry and seeing how those norms come together to, to, form, to form an international global norm. Um, now, I, I think that probably these, these concepts aren't necessarily mainstream concepts that everybody has dealt with a lot in their studies. So I'll just point out one or two things that we can think about as, as we go through and, uh, and I'll kind of revisit those so that it's sort of the key takeaways. Um, the first is I'd like to establish at least a, a sort of a baseline understanding of what the, of the, the nature of the problem. So how, how, how radically uh, we need space uh, regulation towards space sustainability. And so just a general understanding of the problem. Uh, secondly, I think it's really important also to get a, to have a general idea of how different countries are accounting for this problem and what, what regulation exists nationally and also an idea of the international framework that exists for regulating space sustainability as well. Um, and I'll give you a hint, it leaves us, it leaves us wanting. Uh, the, and thirdly, I think it's really important also that we can all uh, understand that the, the licensing regime that exists for outer space activities, it ha there are a lot of little moving parts. So there are lots of things that a country can do slightly differently to the last, um, you know, that, that ultimately contributes to a different regime. Uh, but those, those levers, those tools um, that the countries can use to alter, to alter the, that framework, uh, they are, there's lots of small ones rather than a couple of big radical changes. So what we see is a lot of similar systems that actually kind of look the same at the outset from a broad view and then kind of a, a lot different when you kind of go in and see the, see the, the, the intricacies of it. So I'll just draw your attention to the image on the screen there. We've got this artist's rendering of planet Earth, uh, which good news is it's not actually accurate. The bad news is the problem is probably far worse than the image uh, indicates. Uh, and, and I've used my background today, my space junk background, which is probably a little bit more accurate, but still probably lacking. Um, so we have a couple of thousand active satellites that we use every single day. Um, a lot more satellites that we don't use, the dead ones, the retired ones, and the broken ones, um, 29,000 or so. And we have probably closer to a million objects that are about a centimetre in size or, or bigger that present enormous risk to um, space infrastructure, critical infrastructure that we have in outer space, 
and to human spaceflight as well. And that is something that is going to be sort of more and more prominent over the next few years. Um, the, problem, the problem is not necessarily that there is um, so much space junk right now that we can't use space, although it is getting to that, it's getting that way. The problem is that we are going, we are facing a period of a rapid expansion uh, in our use of space. So you see 3,200 active satellites, SpaceX alone uh, has been granted approval for another 6,000. So we're looking at, we're not looking at a gradual increase in the numbers of satellites. We're looking at, you know, sort of that kind of population spike style um, uh, increase in, in our use of space. Now, I thought it was really interesting that Malia said, um, our right to right to the internet, and I and and I tend to agree. I think of it in some ways as a right to communicate more than more than a right to the product itself. But uh, if we think about space, the infrastructure that's in space, um, we rely on it for just about everything that we do um, in, in in Australian society and in sort of modern society as well. So if you imagine that all of that kind of ceases to be, um, I've, I've heard people refer to it as a uh, as a space junk apocalypse, and I, I'm actually not opposed to that term because I think if you look behind me, you can kind of see what we're, what we're dealing with. Um, you know, you can think about all of the way that we live life currently, whether it's Zoom or electronic payments or internet or weather reports or anything else, navigation, it's all reliant on space technology. So it'd be very difficult to live the way that we do without that technology. So it's very important that we protect that environment and we ensure the long-term sustainability of it. So that's the problem and why it's important to regulate space sustainability. Now, there are a couple of things to note about the way that countries have regulated this. First of all, most countries have a space law which sets up the framework for licensing the activities in outer space. Um, in the UK and New Zealand, for example, those two countries adopt a more minimalist approach. They have a slightly different style for the way that they've regulated that. And they've referred to international law. They've said, you know, uh, activities have to be in accordance with the international obligations uh, so that you know, it, with due regard for the other activities in outer space, um, with regard to safety, ensuring obviously that orbital debris is kept to a minimum. Um, in New Zealand, obviously, that's at least that's where that, that's made explicit. In the UK, not so much. Um, that would be fine if the international law that exists, the international obligation that existed, uh, was sufficient. However, it's not. The international laws were set about 50 years ago and don't actually account for the space industry that we have today. So the question that we really need to, to look to, and, and I, I wish I had time to talk about the US, but I'm afraid that's maybe something you guys can reach out to me if you're interested. I, I can give you my US spiel, um, you know, directly one-to-one uh, -one if that's something that interests you. Um, but really what we need to think about now as we go forward is where does Australia fit in here? Um, we do already have a very basic licensing regime, but there's a lot of opportunity for us to go beyond. Uh, we can be a circuit breaker in some sense and that we can sort of redefine, set that bar a little bit higher. Um, we don't have to follow the examples that have been set by countries that haven't quite done enough. We can actually set our new uh, set of bar for ourselves. So lacking the time to go into it, I'll leave it there and I'll encourage anybody to reach out to me, henry.strong at ANU, just everybody else's email address. And, uh, and yeah, please hit me up with questions. Thank you. Henry, can I ask a question? Can I assume yeah, sure. that the dot is a full stop between your first and surnames and your middle name isn't actually dot? Oh, no. <laughs> no, wouldn't that be cool? Um, no, no. My, yeah, Henry, first name, dot surname at anu.au. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I won't be so facetious this time. I'm just going to say, right. I actually, um, I presented recently with a, a, an academic called Bruce Cahan. He's based um, in the US. And okay. he and I are both members of Stanford's Codex Group, and we presented um, on, called, on a piece called Trust in Space. Now, what Bruce wants to do is set up an international space exchange, a financial exchange mm -hmm. for landing spaces, resources mined in space. And while I was listening to your presentation, I suddenly thought, wouldn't it be good if there was value for recycling space junk, and if yes. that could be put onto yeah. an exchange as well? well anyway, I'm going to connect you absolutely. with Bruce. Please do. I mean, my, my immediate comment to that is that the only ways that exist currently to remove space junk from the atmosphere, oh, sorry, from, from orbit, is to burn it up in atmosphere. So, you know, in that sense, actually retrieving it intact is very difficult, um, but definitely something to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Fascinating. And I absolutely love um, the, the use of the visual. It was really, really um, compelling. Yes. But also bringing it back to Australia, although I do know we've got Venezuela almost in the middle of that graphic. That yeah. rendering of the Earth, which is good to see. I know, I know, it's actually something around Guatemala, but Venezuela's right there. So well done, Henry. Yeah, if sure. there was a competition, you would have just got more points for that. 
Oh, but this is not a competitive event. I remember that. I remember that. You too. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so presentation number 11. My goodness, we are about to hear from Karen. Um, Karen is doing a Bachelor of International Security Studies and um, Bachelor of Laws Honours at ANU. And the title of Karen's presentation is Regulating the Use of AI by Government. Karen, over to you. All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Pip. Apologies for the slides and the text. I feel like I got the short end of the stick coming after Henry. But anyway, um, yeah, it's great to be here tonight among this group of really fantastic and students all undertaking really interesting and really distinct um, work and research in this developing area of law and tech. I think it speaks a lot to the opportunities that are available at the ANU if you do want to get um, involved. Um, of course, thank you, Pip, Will, and the team for organising this showcase. It's been really fantastic. Um, and on that note, I'll just jump into what I have been involved in this year. So at the beginning of this year, I had the wonderful opportunity to work as a research assistant for Will. And in that role, I was able to contribute to one of the many projects that he's undertaking right now, but this project in particular relates to regulating the use of AI by government. And the project split in two phases. So phase one was to really conduct an audit of how current jurisdictions around the globe are regulating or are not regulating the use of AI by government. And then phase two, which builds off the research um, in phase one, will then be to create a model law um, that really addresses the current gaps in um, the regulation now that legislatures can hopefully adopt and in so doing then minimise the harmful use of AI by government and ensure that if or when that does occur, that firstly government is held accountable and that secondly individuals affected then have an appropriate pathway to seek uh, redress or compensation. I believe the uh, model law phase of the project is set to be delivered in 2021, um, early 2021. So watch this space. It's really fantastic and um, necessary uh, work that Will's doing right now. And I think it's one of the first in the world. And it will certainly um, affect how Australia navigates and moves forward in terms of regulating the use of AI and more broadly the use of tech by government. In terms of my more specific contributions, I was tasked um, with conducting a sweep of the current legislation that exists across all OECD states that regulates or establishes um, parameters on the use of AI by government. And it became evident pretty quickly that there really isn't much regulation. And where regulation does exist, it's developed in quite a piecemeal way, which means that there is definitely a need for a comprehensive legal framework. So it's great that Will's project is directly addressing that need. Um, I was also tasked with uh, conducting a sweep of just the general literature that currently exists on AI and law reform more broadly. Um, so that includes research papers and policy papers. Um, and again, uh, I was met with not a lot of research. Um, at university, I feel like I'm faced with the opposite problem where I go to research a topic and there are way more papers than I can possibly get through. But in this case, um, yeah, that wasn't the case. And where research did exist, there was really a focus on a preference for soft law um, with emphasis on self-regulation and ethics. And I think as law students, um, we're all sceptical of how effective self-regulation can be when it really leaves the use of AI um, essentially outside the formal legal process. Um, the other task that I got to complete, was, which was really fun, um, was to data mine uh, for statistics on RoboDebt, which we've heard about before, um, Compass, which is a US machine learning system that is used to assess uh, recidivism rates and Google DeepMind, which is a data matching system used by the UK in their healthcare sector. So all of these were very controversial systems and schemes that attracted quite a lot of um, yeah, co controversy and quite a lot of criticism, but interestingly, didn't actually change um, 
the legislation or, or the regulation around the use of, of tech by government. Uh, yeah, so I guess my key takeaways, I learnt a whole deal throughout this research project, so very grateful to Will for, for the opportunity to do so. Um, I guess as a bit of background, my interests um, that have developed throughout being uh, a student at ANU Law have really been um, administrative and constitutional law because they both deal with how the might and power of government and of the executive are controlled and throughout this research project, pro project and in researching the use of AI by government I've gotten an insight really into how that power balance between the government and the individual can and, and will shift uh, with the sort of development of technological innovation and why it is incredibly necessary to ensure proper regulation and proper parameters. Um, yeah, it's also rewarding in the sense that I think technology and AI will, will bleed into every area of law. And so right now I am doing an international law course and uh, in, in the readings I'm cognizant um, and ask questions about how, how the law will change to reflect how technology is changing and how government is using technology. Um, yeah, so that's it from me. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, I loved your presentation and it really came, for, it came to the fore that there is a sense that we can in this country and in this university, not only support government, but scrutinize government. And I think we live in a time in, on this planet when it's actually important to embrace that and to realise that we're, we're very fortunate to live in a country where we can do this and to attend universities that are generously publicly funded, as well as also having opportunities for people like Will, for academics like Will, to secure very hotly contested, significant funds to do important research. Um, so anyway, congratulations on that, Will, but also without, without these amazing students, we don't get the work done. So well done, Karen. Thank you. Um, that was a brilliant um, presentation and great to get that sense also of your background and your, why your interest actually has come about and the other studies that you're doing. I think it's terrific. Um, anyway, congratulations, Karen. It was a great presentation. Loved your slide, Karen. Nothing, <laughs> nothing to be said about that. Thank you. Um, you leave us with content, which is a great thing. So, Last but not least, we have Sarah, and Sarah's presentation is called Regulation of AI in the Public Sector, and these are insights also from research conducted with Will, and um, Sarah is undertaking a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws, obviously, as an undergraduate student, um, and it's wonderful to um, bookend with um, another one of our amazing undergrad students. So, Sarah, over to you. Hi, um, and thanks Pip and Will um, for organising all of this. Um, and yeah, I just want to sort of echo what Karen and our other speakers said. Um, the showcase has been really interesting so far and I think, I think it's been like particularly useful to um, hear the people that are writing, you know, in-depth research papers and doing their masters on this to realise that there are so many different areas of law within sort of technology and the law. Um, it's been, been really interesting. I've Theme where this sort of area of law can go in, in lots of different directions. Um, so my experience has been slightly different this year and like Karen, um, I got involved through doing research work for Will. Um, and in fact, before I ended up doing that, I'd never really thought about AI as an area of law that I would find particularly compelling because I've always really enjoyed more of the legal theory and sort of shied away from technology because I don't really understand science and sort of thought, I can't do that, that's not for me. Um, but yeah, through Will, I've ended up looking into it and I'm really glad, it's very interesting. Um, so just a bit of context, um, I was helping him um, on his Mindaroo project and as Karen's kind of outlined, um, there were two main parts, the legal audit phase and the model law phase. Um, so I was involved in the legal audit phase, um, which saw me, among other things, um, reading up on different legal frameworks um, across OECD countries mostly focusing on America, Canada, the UK, France and Germany, and then sort of compiling a library of um, different scandals that had shocked the world. Um, and also yeah, looking into the legislative framework and similar to Karen realising that there really isn't much out there um, and that what is probably the benchmark is, um, is in Europe and it still is lacking certain things. Um, I think what I found really interesting were how different, sort of like the different scandals and how things had played out. Um, 
So I think what I want to briefly talk about in this presentation is um, just to have a look at a few of them, a few of the different scandals that I've noticed um, and what I think we can learn from it. And I think um, I was sort of bringing my own background into this because you know, I am very interested in theory and sort of trying to make sure that when we use technology, we don't just cement inequalities that are already here, but like really actively make sure we're using it to include everyone in society and make sure that the power structures are sort of evening out. Um, so the examples that I wanted to like go into a little bit um, included the predictive, pe predictive policing to the compass system um, in the US and also, um, yeah, but I think before I begin that, I just wanted to say that um, this technology is, is not inherently negative and some of the events I looked at um, really do bode well for the future and I think particularly in Sweden um, they have a very strong automated welfare system um, but hasn't had any of the issues that we've experienced in Australia um, and I think the key reason it seems to be going so well is because there is quite a lot of transparency around it and they also retain this human element. Um, so in Sweden decisions um, are automated, but they're based on really clear public rules, the transparency element. Um, and someone always confirms the application of these rules and also takes responsibility for the decision, which means that there is someone at the other end of the line, so that, so that the person who receives the welfare, if they have an issue, can get in contact with them, rather than just sort of an anonymous letter that says, you know, call the department and then you're on call and on hold for ages and can't really talk to anyone. Um, so I think that there's quite a lot we can learn from this. And a lot that we need to learn from this um, because as we all know the use of technology and automated decision making is just going to proliferate um, and unless we figure out how to properly regulate it it's very liable and probably will be exploited by governments and private companies um, so yeah retaining the human element was a recurrent theme across my research um, and it's very necessary but i think it does also carry with it this, this other risk um, because obviously we all have biases and the way our society is structured at the moment um, is conducive to those biases. So I think that unless humans that are involved in using AI technology, both developing and sort of implementing it and then um, like carrying through decisions that use it, um, need to make sure they confront their own biases. Um, otherwise, the technologies that we use will definitely improve efficiency, but they won't necessarily create more equality. Um, so I think this is particularly evident in the compass technology that the US uses um, for sentencing, prob um, probation and parole. Um, so to give a brief overview, um, this technology uses machine learning algorithms to identify individuals most at risk of recidivism, um, which you know, obviously that's quite brilliant and would be very useful. But as a ProPublica um, investigation revealed, African Americans are more likely to receive false positive scores, um, which is clearly very problematic um, and shows that far more work needs to be done in the space to make sure that this sort of bias um, doesn't happen or that we don't end up using this sort of technology blindly without really thinking about what it's doing for those that are already most marginalised. Um, so yeah, I think like obviously this sort of technology is brilliant and we need to, we need to you know, keep improving it and we, we can't just sort of go back to the dark ages and not use it. But I think it, it also shows this particular example shows that um, we have to make sure that the way that we use it and the values that we're bringing to it um, reflect what we want our society to look like, which should obviously be an inclusive and equal one. Um, so I think sort of to sum up what I've really learned is that when we're using AI in the public sector and um, you know, in government departments, um, respect for all humans and their dignity needs to be at the forefront of both programmers and government officials minds when they use this in technology. Um, otherwise it's likely to simply cement old inequalities and also create new ones. Yeah that's what I wanted to say. Um, and yeah, thanks again for putting this showcase together. It's been, um, been really interesting. Thanks, Sarah. I loved the comment you made at the beginning, um, just acknowledging that you enjoyed hearing what, for example, master's students had been presenting. Because I think when Will and I conceived of this idea, we were thinking, wouldn't it be great if the students could all hear what each other is doing across different programs? And that includes international students, domestic students, first years, you know, it's been terrific. Um, and I loved the way that you focused on the ideas about transparency and then 
just uh, brought in this very pragmatic, quite positive view about, like you're optimistic, but you're also quite pragmatic about the use of technology, but clearly want to see it grounded in values. And you'd be interested to know that um, there's a lot said, at, I'm, in, I'm on a few boards here in Australia, there's a lot said about making our values more transparent. And then asking the question, well, how do you then bake that into the transparency that we expect of technology? And I think that's maybe the, the, the journey we're on, um, but I think you articulate it better than I've heard it put, um, basically, by anyone. You, you've done a very good job with that research, and that's, that's the value of these pieces of research. You get time to think about these things and write on it in quite a deep way, rather than it being a thought in passing. So anyway, congratulations, Sarah. That was really compelling. Um, and don't hesitate to enrol in a master's once you finish. Not that that's the purpose of the showcase at all. <laughs> um, and can I just add, just as we wrap up and we finish, which, by the way, we're on time. Dr. Bateman, do you note this? We are on time. Um, that's why Will is still with us. If we were going to go over, I think we might have lost Will, but we're still here. Um, I just wanted to say it's very um, useful for everybody who's listening to this and thinking, oh, my God, this all sounds amazing. Some of these courses and these, um, these research opportunities and extracurricular opportunities are available if you enroll in the master's program for which you don't need a law degree. And I think it's really important to stress that. We've got a grad cert program, one-off courses and the LLM. Yes, you do need to have a degree, but that degree could be in another um, cognate um, discipline like an arts degree, majoring in history, something like that. But there's a number of degrees that would underpin a very good application into our grad cert or LLM programs. So look us up, look me up, send me an email, everyone else does. Um, so we're about to wrap up. I had a final slide, but my um, slideshow has been bumped. But all it said was thank you very much to marketing. And I also wanted to say thank you very much to our professional staff who may or may not be in this call, but I just wanted to acknowledge all of these students get to this point of the degree because their first port of call in this, in this program is always our professional staff who are the mainstay of keeping the whole show on the road. They're amazing. Um, Will, before we say goodbye and do a final thank you, did you want to add anything? Just to echo your thanks. Thank you, thank you to all of our amazing um, presenters tonight. I learnt a lot tonight, which is an enormous pleasure. At, tw at this point in 2020, um, everybody's so exhausted of Zoom, everybody's so exhausted by new content. It's just wonderful to have all of your expectations matched and exceeded. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Pip, um, for your amazing uh, teamwork putting this, in putting this together and letting me co-badge it. Um, and thank you to the um, ANU professional staff team. Again, uh, I echo everything that Pip said. Um, without you, it couldn't, it couldn't get done. So thank you all so much. Um, happy 2020, everybody. I hope to see as yeah. many of you as possible before, um, the, before we're all up for um, a vaccine-rich 2021. We look forward to it. Okay, well, signing off. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Will, Jan, thank you. And thank to you all, all the presenters, link up with me on LinkedIn and keep in touch, everyone. Thank you. Yes, agreed. Cheerio. Bye-bye.